Welcome to our latest installment on the ancient world. In this two-part video, we'll be exploring the Greek world during the Bronze and Iron Ages. This will provide you with some background on the context for the Iliad and the Odyssey, Homer's two famous epic poems on the Trojan War. But before we begin, one quick note about some of the dates you will find within this video. Depending on the text you use, there may be some discrepancies in terms of the exact dates for different periods during the Bronze and Iron Ages. For our video, the Oxford Classical Dictionary and A History of Ancient Greece by Claude Aurieux and Pauline Schmidt-Pantel served as invaluable guides, as well as the chronology provided by John C. McEnroe in his book on The Architecture of Minoan Crete. You'll find a bibliography at the end of this video. Ready? Okay, let's go visit Bronze Age Greece, or as the Greeks call it, Hellas. The Bronze Age is a period of time in Greek history that owes its name to the appearance of metallurgy learned from civilizations of the Near East. Before the appearance of bronze, most people used tools made of stone or bone or other materials. Bronze, which is an alloy of copper and tin, started being used in the Aegean region around Greece during this time, and its possession became a sign of high social status. But let's go back a bit to set the scene and see what was happening around the Aegean Sea just before the Bronze Age. One of the first civilizations to arise out of the Aegean region was known as the Cycladic Civilization. They inhabited a group of islands in the Aegean Sea known as the Cycladic Islands. You can see that these islands get their name from the round circular shape that the group of islands form. Very little is known about them except that their people first lived in mud huts then in stone-built ones. They practiced agriculture, hunting, and fishing. Archaeological excavations have uncovered tombs that reveal the Cycladic peoples buried their dead with objects such as pots, bronze daggers, blades, and marble figurines. These marble figurines are often quite recognizable by their shape and configurations. They appear to be stylized representations of humans and typically have a flat face and folded arms. Some configurations of figurines have also proved puzzling, as it is hard to determine what they really represent. You can see here one of the more famous images of Cycladic figurines, thought to represent musicians. Scholars and archaeologists have yet to agree on a definitive function for these figurines. Were they merely objects intended for burial? Were they idols of the gods intended to be worshipped? Were they dolls? The only thing we do know is that many of them were found in grave sites belonging to the Cycladic civilization. Another civilization to inhabit the Aegean region during the Bronze Age lived on the island of Cyprus. Perfectly positioned at the intersection of different sea routes connecting the Near East and the rest of the Mediterranean Sea, there were three main periods that saw development on the island of Cyprus. The first period on Cyprus was known as the Early Bronze Age, or Early Helladic Period. Excavations of Early Helladic Cypriot art have included vases with patterns, painted lines, and abstract geometric motifs. It was around this time that the first written texts called Cypro-Minoan also began appearing. These bore a resemblance to Cretan Linear A. Fun fact, until this day, no one has yet been able to decipher the Linear A writing system. Will you be the first? The second period on Cyprus was known as the Middle Bronze Age or Middle Helladic Period. It was around this time that the Greeks began arriving in the region and also started having commercial contact with a people known as the Minoans. More on that later. The third period on Cyprus was known as the Late Bronze Age or Late Helladic Period. This era was a rocky one and began with a period of destruction, followed by the development of a number of sites close to the sea. As you see from the map, Cyprus is uniquely positioned at the juncture of a number of maritime trade routes, and it therefore had the opportunity to interact with a number of different civilizations around the Mediterranean Sea. Thanks to commercial contact, different craft techniques from Syria, Egypt, Babylonia, and Mycenae were practiced here. You'll often find that with commercial contact also comes an increase in the exchange of ideas, artistic trends, and even technology. Bronze Age Cyprus was, in a way, an economic and intellectual hub for the Mediterranean. And now we come to Crete, 
a mountainous island to the south of the Cycladic Islands and cradle of the Minoan civilization. Said also to be the mythical home of that mythical king, Minos. Remember him? The king who demanded a tribute of seven boys and seven girls to be sent from Athens? They would be thrown into the labyrinth on Crete as offerings to the Minotaur to be devoured. Fun fact, one of the youths who volunteered as tribute was Theseus, the hero from our video on Athenian democracy, who slew the Minotaur and was said to be the first to institute a proto-democracy in Athens. Anyway, back to Crete and the Minoans. Around the 1900s, a British archaeologist by the name of Sir Arthur Evans had posited that the Mycenaean civilizations of the Greek mainland, which we'll learn about in part two, actually had its origins in Crete. He started excavating at a site on Crete known as Knossos, and uncovered a large palace complex whose labyrinthine layout and numerous bold depictions reminded Evans of the mythical king Minos. Thus, it prompted him to name this civilization the Minoans. The Minoan civilization, like Cyprus, is also divided into three main periods. In the early Minoan period, there are no outstanding characteristics of which to take note. The middle Minoan period is one where we start seeing the establishment of what's called the palace civilization, where the political, economic, and social organization of the Minoan people centered around the palace. Notable palaces that have been excavated by archaeologists include the famous Palace of Knossos, as well as those at Malia, Phaistos, and Zakros. The Minoan Palace was a group of dwellings, complexes, and rooms that often centered around a rectangular courtyard and consisted of different stories in height. You can see from this reconstructed image of the Palace of Knossos why Sir Arthur Evans would have thought this palace resembled a labyrinth. It looks like a maze! The palace space was organized according to public, private, and economic functions. The main entrance to this palace was known as the Propylium. You may have noticed that, unlike most palaces, the Minoan palace doesn't appear to be surrounded by defensive walls and seems largely unfortified. There are various theories out there as to why this may be so. Some suggest that because Crete was an island, there was a smaller chance of outside invasion. Perhaps the Minoans were not a particularly warlike people. Another theory posits that because there were so few household objects like combs, utensils, etc., that you might find regularly around a palace that was being used every day, perhaps this was not a palace at all, but more a temple or administrative complex. This is an image of what is traditionally called the throne room. While it may appear to be big, it's actually quite small in size, hardly what you would expect of the throne room belonging to a king of such a powerful sea people. Let's focus on the famous Palace of Knossos for a little bit more. The truth is, we know very little about the Minoan civilization. If we believe in the theory of Knossos and other palaces being a religious complex, there were no built-up cult sites, and this leads many to assume that the Minoans practiced their religion in open spaces or palace halls. And funny enough, not many religious objects were found there, aside from some figurines, depictions of bulls, and two-headed axes known as labrys. This statuette of the snake goddess found at Knossos is one example of what has been interpreted as a religion in which women played a dominant role. And the prevalence of bull horns and bull imagery in decoration, objects, and paintings found in Minoan palaces have been interpreted by archaeologists as symbols of bull worship. These horns of consecration adorn the tops of Minoan shrines and may have decorated the palaces. The most famous depiction of bulls can be found in the Bull Leaping Fresco, also sometimes referred to as the Toreador Fresco, in which youth are seen to be vaulting over a charging bull. While the details behind this practice are much debated, was it a religious ritual that was actually practiced? A theatrical display meant to underline man's mastery of nature, or just a symbolic representation of the heavens? Many scholars nevertheless believe that bulls and bull leaping were a centerpiece of Minoan culture. Fun fact, did you know that many parts of the Palace of Knossos we see today were actually painted and reconstructed by Sir Arthur Evans and his team? After Evans and his team excavated the site, they wished to restore some of the former splendor of the palace so that visitors could see what it might have looked like. 
Wooden beams and reinforced concrete pillars were put up, and frescoes painted to complete images of the partial paintings that had survived. Most of the dolphin fresco was painted by Dutch artist Piet de Jong. And other frescoes, such as The Prince of the Lilies, Ladies in Blue, and Cup Bearers, were all restorations by Swiss artist Emile Giron. This type of restoration by modern archaeological standards is, of course, a big no-no. Again, we know very little about the Minoans and their civilization. Much of our perception surrounding their culture has been influenced by Sir Arthur Evans' own interpretations, also influenced by the art found on the sites, and by a lack of clear written sources. Was there a centralized power system? Were they a peaceful or warlike civilization? Some say that their art depicts the Minoans as a fun-loving people who enjoyed hunting and nature. Until we gain more insight from more concrete written records, which would include someone cracking Linear 8 probably, scholars have had to base most of their understanding about Minoan civilization on archaeological findings. The late Minoan period is the last period in our exploration of the Minoan civilization. While modern scholarship now divides this period into three subsections, for the sake of our video, we'll try to keep it simple. Recall that Crete was an island perfectly centered between several surrounding civilizations. It was a time when the Minoans had much contact with the rest of the Mediterranean, and frescoes excavated from the palaces reflect their ties to the sea. Crete's influence and power with respect to other civilizations at that time grew during the late Minoan period. The term we use to describe a people who are a great sea power is known as a thalassocracy, from the Greek words thalassa, meaning sea, and kratos, meaning power. Recent scientific findings and archaeology determine that around the 1600s BCE, a massive volcano explosion originating from the nearby island of Thera, modern-day Santorini, and 100 times more powerful than the one at Pompeii, caused large-scale destruction to the island and surrounding regions, including Crete. The shockwave and purported tsunami would have inundated much of the surrounding islands, including Crete. In fact, evidence of this destructive wave has been discovered in excavations far inland on the island of Crete. The Minoans, however, were able to rebuild, including palaces at Knossos, Malia, Phaistos, and Zakros, during what is now known as the Neo-Palatial or New Palace period. But in around 1450 BCE, almost all the Cretan palaces were destroyed, with the exception of Knossos. Scholars provide different theories about what amounted to the decline of Minoan civilization. Theories include natural disasters such as earthquakes, internal disturbances, and outside invasions possibly from the Mycenaeans of mainland Greece. The Mycenaean culture of the Greek Bronze Age will be the topic of our next video, so tune into part two of our exploration of Bronze and Iron Age Greece.